so I really want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. So, but my talk probably would be slightly different from all the talks you have heard in this. So my take on complex systems is like you find out a system which is of course good looking and all that and uh, a system that is not so well studied, you go there and there will be lots of things where you can just apply your high school, maybe undergraduate physics and do a lot of things. So this talk is something like that, okay? All simple stuff. So yeah, so let's see. So this is the outline. I'll uh, maybe not many of us have studied about glaciers. So briefly, I'll just uh, tell you what is a glacier and what are the things that is going on there and why should you study them. Then I'll come to Himalayan glaciers and basically I'll show you some data for which we did some very simple, use some very simple models and we could understand some things about those data. So it's about this. So that's, that's the plan, okay? So uh, it's not, so what is this? This is uh, Baltoro Glacier, this is in Karakoram. This is probably K2, maybe this or this. No, K2 is here. So this is in Karakoram and the scale is, it's like few, I mean, maybe 40 kilometers long and the glacier is, uh, this is a glacier that's flowing and all these uh, bright patches you see, they are seasonal snow. And how did you get it? There's a uh, satellite called Landsat. So this is, a, this is some seven Landsat images taken over some 15 years and put on top of another, okay? It's some time lapse of this thing. And this glacier is, this ice is getting accumulated here and flowing down the valley. And as it goes down, it starts melting. And when it reaches here, no ice is left. So glacier is basically some kind of steady state, which is, which is determined, length determined by the competition between the accumulation in the higher reaches and the melting that is happening here. And these are all tributary glaciers. So they're basically like rivers, but made up of ice, that's all. Okay, and the speeds are like maybe 100 meter per year. So that's the kind of numbers we are looking at. Okay. So this is, uh, these lines would be probably be more than, this line that you see, it's probably, it's called snow line. And that would be something like five to six kilometers. And this would probably be, I, I'm not sure about this, but typically this would be 4,000 kilometers. This line is 5,000. And of course, K2 is some 8,000 meters, okay? So as I said, glaciers are basically, for to have glaciers, we need accumulation. So wherever there is some land and some precipitation above the snow line, glaciers will form, that's all. And I'll get snowfall, that's where these things are. Then if I have like high peaks, some of the snow also come, will come down to the glacier in form of avalanche and wind blown snow. So these are all sources of ice, sources of snow for the glacier. Then that snow with time gets converted into ice. Snow is like fluffy and white, density would be 200. Uh, gram per uh, liter and ice would be something like 900 gram per liter. So over time that would get converted into ice which is really solid, I mean looks solid, looks like a piece of glass if you pick it up and go to the glacier and pick it up, it will be like a piece of glass. But this solid is actually, as we have just seen, it's flowing downhill. So, it, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, process. In Himalaya it will be few years. But if you go to Antarctica, you may take few, it may take few, few hundred years. So basically you have very, uh, this uh, snow crystals, they are like, um, I don't know, they are like finger-like objects. They slowly get rounded up and that process is thermally driven. So here, because uh, temperatures can really go high up in summer, so because of that it can happen in few years. And then, but the ice can flow because it's a very hot solid, it's very close to its melting temperature, that's the point. So because of, there will be lots of defects inside, and that will, because of that, there'll be creep of solid, I mean, the standard thing. So it basically flows like a viscous solid, I mean, viscous liquid. And if you want to uh, estimate the viscosity, we know the size of the pipe. Let's assume it's water. We know the velocity. I mean, apply any formula. I mean, it's just a basically order of magnitude calculation. And if we use this Poiseuille's formula that we have learned in our, uh, maybe class 12th, you will see the number I'll get is something like 10 to the power 13 Pascal second. Okay, that's a huge number. For example, air is 10 to the power minus five, water is 10 to the power minus three, honey is 10. And I do not know of any other substance except the rock in the mantle. That is like some 10 to the power 20, okay? So this is really, really viscous. So 
So that's what is going on. And but uh, then it's not really like water because in water, if I suppose I have a sheet of water flowing on an inclined plane, the stress profile would be linear, and so would be the strain profile because it's a Newtonian liquid. Stress and strain are they are I mean, linearly proportional to each other. But ice is not. In ice, strain rate would increase with stress. It's actually, there's a cubic relation. Maybe if I have time, I'll come to that. And so basically, it's a shear thinning liquid. So if I have more shear, which is happening at the bottom of the glacier, it flows more easily than the top. Top is giving like a solid. So it's amazing that in these glaciers, if you go there, you'll see huge crevasses, which are cracks. Liquid cannot support cracks, but there are crevasses in the glacier. That's because on the top, the viscosity is really, really high, and it's like a solid. At the bottom, it's like more viscous. It flows more easily. And apart from this deformation due to this creep, there is also sliding, which is a failure at the bottom. So these are the two processes that is making the glacier flow. OK. So yeah. And then uh, I have accumulation on top. Things are flowing down. As they come down, they will start melting. And melting is, of course, controlled by the surface energy that is available. And that is mainly radiation budget. There will be hundreds of watts per meter. Up, I mean, both uh, short wave incoming from solar radiation and long wave incoming. And because snow and ice, they have uh, high reflectivity, a lot, lot of it is like uh, is reflected off, but whatever remains is, 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 a, is causing the melt. And also there is some latent heat flux, which is like uh, evaporation, uh, sublimation, or um, melting of water. And there is sensible heat flux, because uh, if air temperature is higher, it will be some uh, uh, turbulent heat exchange and things like that. So that's all is causing some melt. And this uh, fight between this melt and accumulation is determining the glacier length. So that's what is going on. And often we talk about a mass balance curve. Because of all these processes, I mean, if you, in the end, what you end up with, these are some experimental curve. This is uh, the mass balance value. Positive is accumulation. And this is melting or ablation. And it basically decreases, in melting, melt increases linearly with uh, elevation. So in the end, I have a mass balance curve or whatever. The mass balance is linear in elevation. Is so it's, it's basically per square meter of area, how much ice, water equivalent of ice is melting or you are adding. OK? So it's just a um, flux at the surface. That's all it is. Sorry? The unit of this thing is meter per year because it's a thickness you're talking about. Yes, yes, yes. It's basically the thickness change at the surface. Sorry? Ah, so this is all, I mean, uh, this compaction is taken care of by uh, converting everything to water equivalent. OK, so here I have accumulation at higher reaches, and here I have melting. And what flow is doing is, is bringing ice from higher elevation and get it to lower uh, elevations. And uh, because of this fight in the end, and because it's a very uh, highly viscous fluid, it tries to reach a steady state where net accumulation is equal to net ablation. And so basically, if you do an area-weighted average of this, of this line, you will get it, I mean, and set it to 0. That determines the glacier length. And often we talk about uh, this E, which is where the mass balance is 0. This is called ELA. Equilibrium line altitude. So what climate is trying to do, climate is changing this line. Typically, this line, the slope of the line doesn't change. The ELA changes. So if I have warmer climate, the ELA would go up. If I have uh, climate is cooling down, ELA comes down. Okay. So when we are talking about, so in this, ELA is where the climate dependence is mostly like entering at a very simple level. So it's just a snow line. ELA we can, I can think of as the end of summer snow line, the highest elevation the snow line attains. Above that, I can assume, OK, there is no melting crudely. So that ELA, long-term value of that ELA, of course, there are annual fluctuations. But long-term value of that ELA is what is controlling the mass balance and the glacier length and basically affecting the glacier dynamics. Because it's such a, I mean, viscous and so on, it has a long response time because of the slow velocities. Slow, um, I mean, flow speed, it has large response time. So annual fluctuation, it can't see. But what it is looking at is decadal changes in the ELA. OK? Yes. Uh, 
So it shift is, yes, so the shift is like this way. This is elevation, okay? So it's, it's, the snow line is moving to higher elevation. So that's what basically happens. There will of course be some changes in the shape, but that is maybe second order, okay? Okay, so then why study glaciers? I mean, I'll just give some quick uh, this thing. So for example, this is one nice example that uh, is due to old elements. What he said that let's assume that glacier is steady. Now its length will change if the climate changes or the temperature changes, or if I, let's say change, I mean the glacier is not at its steady state length, it's somewhere else. So then he just wrote down a linear response. I mean linear, uh, yes, something like that. And then applied this, now, now see if you know L prime is the rate of change and L prime is the deviation from steady state and T prime is something, let's say we don't know. But for many glaciers, the length record is available. So he took some 150 glaciers all over the world and then applied this calibration formula to solve for temperature, okay? So what, uh, again, uh, maybe I, I should, uh, so what the data I have is length change of glacier. And then this length change is driven by two things. One, temperature change, another, if the glacier is not at its, I mean, uh, instantaneous steady state. So if we have this L prime and DL prime dt available, which you can get from this L of t curve, then I can compute t prime. That's what he did, and then he averaged over all the glaciers, and he obtained this red curve, and this black line is the uh, instrumental record, which is available only for maybe 150 years. So during that period, it uh, matches, which tells you that glaciers are like thermometers, which can be reliably used to compute global temperatures, for example. And then, of course, glacial records are longer, so you can have longer records. So this is just an example. One interesting thing is that uh, places like Alps, they have glacier records, which starts maybe 500 years back. And this is one of the, this is Gangotri Glacier, one of the most well documented glacier in India, but that has only few records. So in India, we don't have such detailed records. That's a big problem that will come to. Another important uh, point is that, uh, of course, all this water, if glaciers shrink, that water is going to end up in the ocean and raise ocean level. For example, if Antarctic ice sheet it melts, it will lead to some 70 meter what of sea level rise and so on and so forth. Glaciers as such are only one meter. But the point is that compared to ice sheets, glacier, glaciers are fast objects. They respond in decadal scale where ice sheets will be hundreds of years. So that's why right now this three millimeter per year sea level is going, going on. Although glaciers are maybe 1% of the total ice volume, they are contributing to one third of that. And one third is coming from uh, the ice, ice sheets all over the world, like Antarctica and Greenland, and rest of one is just thermal expansion of water. Okay, and another important road glacier space is that they shape the mountains. Okay, they erode, they carry sediment, they deposit. So that, way, for example, this is somewhere in Tibet where glaciers are not there right now, but you can see this area looks different from this area. This is how a fluvial landscape, a landscape, I mean, carved by rivers would look like, and this is a glacier landscape. So that's also another interesting. I mean, a lot of people are studying how glaciers are shaping our mountains. In fact, there is something called glacial Batsa hypothesis, which says these glaciers are so efficient in eroding, the as you build your mountain, as they go higher up, the moment glaciation starts, erosions, like they really shoot up. So because of that, uh, the snow line, I mean, most of the mountains in the world, they cannot grow maybe 1.5 kilometer above the snow line, okay? So they say if Himalaya were in the higher latitudes so where snow lines are lower, Himalaya would not be able to reach some fantastic, such fantastic elevations. Okay, another very, very important, that's why like our projects get funded, I mean, of glaciers is that their milled water feed our rivers. So for example, in rivers like Indus, maybe about 50% of the water is glacial milled water. So there is very, very important. Turns out for river like Ganga, it's not so important. Maybe, and uh, particularly upstream areas, it, it, it is significant, but as you come downstream, because monsoon is so huge, it just, uh, it just uh, swamps all the contribution from glaciers. And we will have tried to estimate, for example, the, uh, I mean, the glacial contribution to rivers in Ganga, and their numbers, 
depending on what method you use, you get number which can be 1% to something like 20%. So that's because our glaciers are not really well known. There are a lot of uncertainties. And uh, the data on water cycle and climate on Himalaya, it's, 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 it's in very bad shape. And in fact, uh, there are other, pro other complications in Himalayan glaciers which are not accounted for in the present glacier models. So because of all that, our estimates are, needs to be improved. So that's something we should keep in mind. But yeah, so now, uh, as I was saying, Himalayan glaciers are slightly different basically because of topography. So this is uh, somewhere in Bhutan. This image is taken from Wikipedia. So this is the ridge where the highest peaks are. This glacier, th that's a water divide. They are draining here on the southern side of the Himalaya. And these are glacier, this is a glacier, for example, another glacier that's draining into Tibet. But they do not see such high relief because they are draining into a high plateau, which is five, thousand, five kilometer of in elevation. So because of that, these guys, they are surrounded by high cliffs, which are throwing in a lot of avalanches, avalanches of rock and avalanches of snow. Because of that, if you can see this glacier, it actually looks brown in this image. Of course, this is not a real color image. It's a false color image compared to this glacier, which is look uh, white and clean. So Himalayan glaciers, they're full of debris. The surface is, so it's a satellite photo. It's, it's again a Landsat image. So, uh, and that completely changes, uh, I mean, not completely, to a great extent that affects their, uh, the energy balance at the surface is complex. And also this blanket of debris, it provides insulation. So it changes the melt curve also. I'll come to that. So because of these complications, and also the dynamics of this debris layer itself is very, very complex and people has, I mean, that's uh, maybe the most important active area of research on Himalayan glaciers right now. So other point is, of course, uh, Himalayan glaciers, they also receive a lot of snow during summer month. Usually summer month is where melt takes place, but here because of monsoon rainfall, there's a lot of accumulation during summer. So that's something you'll have to keep in mind. And as I uh, think, long-term data on Himalayan glaciers, rivers, and climate is missing. That's a big problem. And the kind of things that uh, we are interested in is, what are the recent changes that have taken place over decadal and century scale? What are the future changes under given climatic scenario? But really, it doesn't make sense to talk about this too much because the climate, I mean, predictions themselves, they have such huge uncertainties that uh, it probably doesn't really, you cannot talk about the glacier change. And then, of course, it's a very important question is what is the contribution of glacier melt water in river runoff and how is it going to change? And what is the effect of debris on energy balance, flow, and hydrology of the glacier? And things like bedrock geometry and ice volume, they are not known in the Himalaya. In uh, Europe, the thing is that if the glacier is clean, there are things like GPR, ground penetrating radar. You can use that and get an estimate. You can map the bed. But in Himalaya, it doesn't work because all this debris material, they scatter electromagnetic uh, waves and you know, cause them to dissipate. So because of these uh, kind of issues, bedrock geometry and ice volume is an unknown quantity in Himalaya. And of course, uh, we are also interested to know what role they play in the evolution of Himalaya. And of course, uh, whatever data we have, if we compile, just like this old Lehman's paper that I was referring to. So these are uh, records of Himalayan glaciers, whatever is available. We could, uh, with uh, Farooq Azam, who is in NIH rookie, we, could, we had compiled all the data that's available and we had shown that as long as debris cover is kind of thin, then this uh, glacier, debris doesn't matter to glacier response. And we could do a similar uh, inversion like uh, Orle Mans. And what we see that Himalayan glaciers are also kind of seeing glo mean global temperature. And over 150 years, I mean, there's large error bar and so on, but mostly over last 150 years, they have been seeing kind of, uh, uh, steady temperature rise and they have been shrinking steadily. So that's what they have been doing. Sorry, here? Ah, this, these are in kilometers, sorry. These are all these bands are kilometers. So for example, Gangotri Glacier, it has lost about two kilometers of length in 150 years. And this glacier is some 30 kilometers long. Okay.
here you are saying uh, here oh so that's the, the that's the, that's zero right 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 that's the initial length it had and from that okay and what is the future as i was saying there is not enough data and lot of uncertainties so it's you can but you can do some simple back of the envelope calculation if you look at their present mass balance last 50 years whatever i mean minuscule data is available you see that they are losing half a meter of water equivalent half a meter of thick, uh, thickness in water equivalent every year and they are typically hundreds of meters uh, thick on the average maybe 100 meter so if you think okay they are losing half a meter every year so that would be 200 years but of course there are complications they are not losing it uniformly and as they lose they are losing more mass at the lower elevations so they are trying to adjust i mean there is a feedback involved here it's not a linear because they, their area is also shrinking that we are not including in this so it will be longer than 200 years and another way of looking at it you the present tla is something like 5000 meters maybe and it's going up from whatever data is, uh, that is available with us it's maybe with, by 10 meter per year and Himalaya has a lot of area, maybe up to 7,000 meters. So the, again, that will be a few hundred years. And if you, people have also calculated these quantities using like all these climate predictions and things like that with slightly more complicated models. But again, the model uncertainties are so huge that their numbers are not so much, I mean, the improvements are not like huge. Okay. So now let us see what is the, some data that uh, uh, we can we have. So what happened is uh, there's this IPCC report that said uh, all the glaciers going to vanish and things like that by 2035. After that, a lot of people use their, I mean, uh, got interested in what is actually happening in Himalayan glaciers. So there are a few papers which have looked at large scale behavior of the Himalayan glaciers, all the glaciers and whatever mass balance, length, area change and things like that. And this is a paper in Nature Climate Change. They talk about the length change. So as you can see, uh, so red dots are like retreat and blue, blue dots are like advance and size of the dot is telling you by how much. So all across the Himalaya things are, I mean glaciers are going down, but in Karakoram it's different. Karakoram actually glaciers are either steady or it's called Karakoram anomaly. So apparently in Karakoram precipitation has increased that has balanced the possible temperature change. But the thing is all these high elevation areas do not really have long term temperature data or precipitation data. All that you have is your glacier data. So it's hard to say what's going on there. But overall you see that there are some, I mean of course they are all mostly retreating and but there is some regional vari, uh, variability so then there is another interesting work so the in, by Scharler and others what they had done they had looked at this uh, satellite images of all these glaciers and computed uh, so basically if you take two images and do image correlation you can try to, you can try to see uh, the pixels that are flowing how much where did they flow to so from that you can calculate a velocity map so they had calculated the velocity and also the glacier length. So this is their length change data. So, but this data has a problem that this kind of, I mean, uh, accurate, I mean, uh, high resolution satellite images are only available after 2000. So this data, all the day, um, uh, image, all the changes that they are talking about is only five year, maybe at most. So that way it has a lot of fluctuation. It's not a long term, I mean, the data is not uh, long term changes. So that, that's one problem with that. But even then what we see, so this is like uh, latitude, longitude, and uh, these are the rate of change. These are the rate of change. And this is the Himalayan arc, this is Karakoram, this is Kundunshan, which is over here. And you see that every region, there are some glaciers which seems like they are advancing, which are these red dots. And some lot of glaciers are there which are retreating. And it's a, like everywhere, it's, 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 so this variability that we see here in over large regional scale, is, it seems like it's very, very local. Like even at one catchment level, there is a lot of differences in, the, there are lots of um, different values you can get depending on which glacier you are looking at, okay? So this is like, I'm um, a puzzle one. This is something we want to understand why that is so.
okay. And the second interesting uh, observation that you can make looking at their data, they also, the, they have actually looked at some 200 glaciers in the Himalaya and about 130 of them are debris covered, okay, kind of glaciers I showed and 60 of them are de kind of debris free. So when you look at the debris covered glaciers, you see the glaciers which are retreating and non-retreating, their ratio is 1 is to 1, okay. But for the glaciers which are debris free, 80 percent are retreating but only 20 percent are stationary which is, ki which is kind of, is not what you would expect because in the end they must be seeing similar climate. Also there are other set of data which is again by remote sensing. From remote sensing you can make a uh, topographic map basically, a digital elevation model and if you do it, I mean uh, after let's say 10 years and compare, you can find out what is the actual thinning. So from that they can calculate, they, people have seen like this Gardel and Kaab and Naimura, their set of papers, all of them see that if you point your, set, I mean, I mean if you are if you're looking at a glacier which is debris cover and another glacier which is not debris cover and compare their thinning rates, they seem to be same or similar within whatever errors that are there. So what we are seeing is here retreat is like 50-50 for debris cover glaciers, retreat and non-retreating and for debris free, they seem to be retreating more. But when you look, talk in terms of thinning, you see similar thinning. So how to understand this, okay? And then again after, uh, subsequently there was another paper which says, depending on this, so they looked at a larger region but similar measurements, Pamir, Karakoram and uh, I mean various regions of Himalaya and they say depending on the region you are looking at, you may get larger, similar or smaller thinning rates in debris covered glaciers compared to debris free glaciers, which makes it more complicated to understand. How do you know about uh, You know by just looking at them. So this is a debris covered glacier and this is a debris free glacier. So the debris looks different uh, when you see it, right? Debris is like just pieces of rocks and boulders and all that. So from the satellite you can make out, satellite image you can make out. Okay, and because they are also measuring velocities, so this is a plot of velocity of Grongbu Glacier which is close to Everest and it looks like the velocities at higher reaches they are about 60 meters per year, but in the debris covered region, this is the extent of the debris, uh, supraglacial debris cover, it has very, very low velocities and this glacier also is not uh, losing length, okay, it's not retreating this particular glacier. But this glacier on the other hand is a clean debris free glacier and this has a velocity profile which does not have this what they call stagnant area. So this is again, this is not one I mean, example, there are many examples, many glaciers which are debris covered but they, and, and not retreating but usually they will have a very long tongue as we call it or turbinous area where the velocity is very low, okay. So why is that? That's our puzzle three. Yes, the reason is this debris is all derived from the mountains on the sur surrounding mountains. And uh, glaciers on the southern side, they are surrounded by high cliffs because the elevation drop is very large. But the glaciers which are flowing to the northern side, they are flowing into a high plateau. So they are not that steep. So that side is gentler. That's why uh, China has lots of roads and here if you want to go to a glacier, you have to walk a lot. So this is an example, uh, this is a glacier in Alps. So if you go to Alps and see a glacier, you'll see something like this. Probably this is what comes to our mind when you think of glacier. But when you go to Himalaya, this is a glacier that we are working on. So you see here, this is probably a few hundred meters. But here, this is two kilometers, okay. And we are standing here so that you can give you some idea of scale. This is Satapand Glacier. This glacier is where river Alaknanda starts from, okay. And you see it's all, this is a glacier, but it's all debris covered. So all these rocks, they are, of all these cliff walls, they are breaking apart and all these pieces of boulders, they are coming here and flowing with the ice. So it will be maybe one meter of debris on top, one meter or less, and below that I have few hundred meters to 100 meter of ice. 
okay and this whole thing is flowing down so the what we noticed that the main difference that uh, this debris cause would co uh, cause is the uh, it will change the uh, energy balance at the surface it will provide insulation to the underlying ice and because of that all these straight lines in the himalaya they come down but do not continue like that they saturate so in the debris covered region because of the insulation insulation provided by the debris melting is not increasing with uh, lowering of elevation that's the main difference that we i mean that's 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 a obvious dif difference that we could uh, see so we thought maybe let's uh, take the simplest model of the glacier that is there in the market and add this piece so our clean glacier would be a straight line and our debris covered glacier will be straight line with a cut off okay and let us see if we can understand all these observations that we had seen so the model is very simple it's just continuity equation in 1d so this is the change in the ice thickness that can happen at any point because of two reason if i add or take out some ice which is this mass balance term or if at that point the ice that is coming from behind is different from ice that is i mean going out so if there is a difference between influx and outflux because ice is incompressible that will lead to a change in thickness so that's that's the content of this equation again mass con just mass conservation so take this equation and here i have u which is i mean two variables so you have to supply some relation between u and h which is here this is nothing but a, i mean solving the nonlinear flow of ice in some very simple case for that for an infinite plane you can solve it and just apply it assuming locally it's it's an infinite plane okay it's shallow, shallow ice approximation so, and this is the sliding term again parameterized for this there is not much uh, i mean really good understanding how but this is one of the parameterization i mean common they used so then run this glacier so take a bedrock which is this blue line that's the valley uh, bottom and then apply this mass balance and you can grow a steady glacier this is my ela this is where accumulation is taking place this is where it's melting if ela goes up this glacier will shrink if ela comes down this glacier will advance okay this is uh, exam an example of a, let's say debris free glacier okay and now with the experiment we are doing we are taking two glaciers one debris covered and debris free in a i mean some simple model of them and then producing a steady state okay by keeping the ela here so this is the velocity distribution of a debris covered glaciers and this is the velocity distribution of a debris free glacier now i move the ela up and see how the velocity changes of course the glacier retreats here to a smaller length here also but in the debris covered glacier i we see that the velocity here is actually slowing down but the length is for this this so this is time t0 this is maybe 30 years 30 60 years and so on so for a long time the length doesn't change only it slows down at the front region and this is exactly what we had seen so we believe that all these glaciers that are assumed stationary in this data set are actually i mean losing mass the ela has gone up they are trying to respond but only that the length is not changing right now right now they are thinning down and velocity is coming down that's what is going on here but that doesn't happen in a debris free glacier and yes i i'll i'll try to say why why is this happening another interesting question is and an interesting point is if you follow the volume the volume change is immediate so this is the length change this debris covered glacier length is not changing for some time but the debris free glaciers immediately starts responding to the step jump but if you look at the volume they kind of show similar behavior although if you really look at closely this guy has higher change of rate the bear glacier so they are not really same but at least the change is immediate okay and so in that sense we can say that this puzzle tree that uh, which is i mean the stagnant area we know why that is there and also we know that uh, they should have similar volume change sorry 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 so that's 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 our solution for one of the puzzles and then as uh, subrati uh, was trying to say sorry this slide didn't come out very well so 
this red line is supposed to be is is the is the, is the emergence velocity or this uh, divergence of f term. So in glaciology terminal in glacier terminology we call this. I don't have much time, is it? Or maybe I'll take two minutes and uh, finish. So uh, this. Uh, if incoming and outgoing don't match, I'll have a vertical change, and that's called emergence or submergence velocity. Because people will go and measure it, and it's a uh, so there. This uh, anyway, I don't have time, so I can't tell you stories right now. So this in a steady state, this emergence or submergence is balanced by accumulation, or ablation, or melt. Okay, so that the surface remains steady. But now, as I perturb my sorry. Now as I perturb my mass balance, so this is the melt, which is balanced by the emergence. Sorry. Now if the mass, mass balance would ch change would be instantaneous. But because it's a slow, slow moving object, the velocities, they cannot change so fast. So they will take time to uh, respond. So initially, the, because of that, and if you look at the mass balance curve here, it changes to this. The difference is a kind of a straight line. But if you look at debris covered glacier, because of this flat region, here nothing changes. So because of that, in this region, in a it really doesn't see the temperature change. It takes a longer time to realize when the flux information from top comes here. So basically, what we said uh, that uh, we should really look at into both these terms, flux change and the mass balance, to talk about how the thinning would happen. It's just that. And uh, one last thing, because uh, oh, oh, one more thing is that uh, now we have this 50-50 uh, this and 80-20 problem. Among these 80, there are lots of stagnant glaciers. So we just took them out and put them into shrinking, uh, in the shrinking set. And immediately that, uh, that uh, number, which was 50-50, becomes 75-25, which is similar to 80-20. So actually, they are seeing similar climate and responding to a similar climate. And uh, then this large fluctuation in uh, retreat rate that we could convert into a warming rate for these glaciers. And that warming rate for whatever station data is available in that region, it looks like there is a similar, whatever warming or cooling going on regionally at that time scale, there is a distribution. And the glaciers are also seeing that. So it's because of that. Yeah, so maybe I'll stop here. So thank you. Uh, yes, yes, yes. But uh, in Himalayan glaciers, I'll, 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 no, no. In Himalayan glaciers, I do not uh, know of any tipping point like that. And if you look at this plot which I had shown, last 150 years they are kind of retreating steadily. So nothing has happened recently. No. Ah, so this plot, if you look at. So this is the signal that is, I mean, they are in the length change signal, and it's kind of uh, uniform. So this tipping point and these things are, uh, they may exist in these ice sheets. Because they are, they, they are like these ice sheets, they, because it's so cold, it doesn't melt so much there. So this, all this ice that accumulates, they have to come out in the ocean through some very fast flowing streams. In those streams, people have, uh, it's possible that those streams, they can suddenly ac start accelerating. And that, so these ice sheets, which are, we, as I was saying, they have uh, centuries of, uh, like, the response time is much longer. They can have some very fast mode of uh, losing ice. That is of uh, concern. But not in the Himalaya. Strong variability. There is seasonal variability of the speed because of the sliding part. It depends on how much water I have at the bottom. So in summer, when there is a large water supply at the bottom, it makes the bed slippery, so the glacier moves faster. So there is some seasonal variability in speed. Maybe maybe factor of I am right, not right now not sure about the numbers in the Himalaya, but maybe a factor. I mean, 50 to 100 percent change is possible. Thank you.